In this video, I'm going to be talking about the song I Am the Cosmos or Cosmos, as our American friends would have it. And I think this is up there amongst my favourite songs ever. It's an incredibly beautiful track. Yes, it is something of an obscurity, but uh, you know, if you know, you know when it comes to the music of Chris Bell and you, you'll realise what a genius he was. You know, tragic that he didn't have any real success in his lifetime. So what I'm going to do is play through a bit of the song for you now and then I'll break it down for you. We've got some beautiful chords and rhythm guitar parts, we've got a nice soaring guitar solo as well, so let's get started. For those of you not familiar with the name Chris Bell, he was one of the founding members of Big Star, the mighty Big Star, one of my favourite bands. They're from uh, Memphis. I suppose you'd describe their music these days as power pop. And I've looked at a couple of Big Star songs previously on this channel. But I think Chris Bell was only a member of Big Star for the first album or so, and then he left. And then from the mid-70s onwards, he was recording various bits of solo material. I don't think very much stuff was released in his lifetime. I think this song, I Am The Cosmos, was released as a single, but then I didn't really come across it until the 1990s when an album came out called I Am The Cosmos, which was kind of a compilation of a lot of bits and pieces of his solo material. And that album would make a really good introduction to the music of Chris Bell, I think. And it does also contain some alternate versions and takes of uh, the song I Am The Cosmos, so that's quite an interesting listen. So let me get started. I'll take you through the rhythm guitar parts, give you a few options there, and then I'll talk you through the guitar solo as well. We're in the key of D. The song kicks off with these chords. <laughs> Such a beautiful chord progression, lovely chord voicings here as well. The first chord is just your basic open position D chord. Then the second chord, and um, this has long sort of been a bit of a mystery to me. I've played this song, I've done a version of this song for many years, but I always used to play the second chord you know, like this, but you know, revisiting it for the purposes of this video, I'm kind of settled on this, this chord. Now, so what I've got, I'm playing a C sharp at the fourth fret on the fifth string. Then I've got frets two on the D and the G, and then a couple of open strings on the top. Top as well. You could put your pinky down on this B note at the fourth fret on the G string, but uh, it sounds more like this first option to me. Little bit of an awkward one to play. I'm using my third finger to play this bass note, then I'm barring my first finger 
to cover the D and the G, but then you need to leave room for the open two top strings to ring as well. Your first finger doesn't want to do that. Another possibility is to fret those two notes with one finger kind of in the middle of that pair of strings. My fingers are a little bit too skinny for that to be uh, to be effective, so I'm, I'm playing it like this. Uh, as far as what this chord is, I mean, to me, it's it's really an inversion of an A chord. It's, you've got an A chord here. If you put a C sharp in the bass, and then you've got those open two strings on top. So I suppose it's like it's like an A sus two, but you've got that C sharp in the bass. And what it gives you is a nice smooth bass line. You're coming from a, a D. descending bass line going down from D to C sharp. It's often a good way to use inversions just as a way of creating nice smooth connections between the chords. The next chord is this one. It's a nice way of playing an E minor 7, so open 2, open, open, 3 and 3. And then this is a lovely variation on a G chord. I've got three muting the fifth string, then open, open, three, and then two on top. You have a major seven on top. And then I'm to an A7, and I'm hammering down at the third fret on the B, so you've got an A7, sus4, going back to an A7. Then the band comes in and we've got a little run down on the low E string, three, two, open, and then we're pushing into that E minor seven chord. And then the G again, or the G with that F sharp in there. And on the G that time, just arpeggiate the top bit of that chord. You can pull off with your first finger there. So I suggest you listen to the recording for the exact picking there. It's quite sparse actually. You've got a lot of chords which is just allowed to ring and hang, but then you can also just arpeggiate some of these chord shapes a little bit or strum some of these chord shapes. It really depends on you know, how you're going to do this. If you've got a band with you, you might want to be a bit more sparse. If you're playing on your own, you could make it a bit busier and a bit more strummy. So that's the opening of the tune. Then we just go round that again. It's played in a very similar way. <laughs> First section of the song, I don't quite know what to call these different sections in the tune. It kind of opens with the main theme, the main section of the tune. Is it a chorus that it starts with? And then there's a little bridge section, which I'm about to get into. Uh, I should mention that there are layers of guitar on this one. So at least a couple of electric guitars, acoustic guitars as well. It's possible that some of these guitars are playing some slightly different voicing. So I, I found myself doing something like this. <laughs> little part played in thirds on the B and G strings. So uh, over the second part of this opening section, so... Actually quite hard to pick out the precise part from the record, but it sounds more or less like this to me. Although it could be kind of starting a bit higher, or maybe got a few options there, but it's nice to have that little fill in there, particularly if you're playing with another guitar player. Then we're into the next section, the B section, the bridge, whatever you want to call it. It starts on the D chord. And then we're going to a B minor chord. And uh, you can just embellish these chords a little bit and have some melody going on. So, so just 
picking out a melody, just releasing uh, my second finger. So you've got an open top string. Yeah, similar thing on the B minor. Just lifting up the second finger, so you've got a B sus two. Um, then we've got a beautiful chord change here to an A minor seven. So open A string and then two open one and open and so far I think most of the chords have been in the key of D major kind of all diatonic this is an A minor 7 which is the 5 chord usually you'd expect the 5 chord to be major or a dominant 7th chord here it's a minor 7th chord so quite an interesting chord change uh, you know a good songwriting tip actually if you want to find some more interesting chords is just to change the quality of some of the chords. So if you usually find a major chord, try making it a minor chord, try making it a dominant seventh chord. And that way you can get some interesting sounds without venturing too far away from the, the key. It still you know, sounds like it, it works. And it's quite a good songwriting strategy, I think. You don't need to uh, overly theorize all of this stuff. I mean, some of these non-diatonic chords in this tune, you can, uh, you, know, you can talk about modal interchange or borrowing from parallel scales and and keys and that can be quite interesting but as a songwriter I think just you know, play around with the, the qualities of your chords so switch major to minor or vice versa throw in a seventh chord and just see what feels good but back to the song we've got the same minor seven and then so again really beautiful I'm playing this which is open fourth and third string first fret and then open string on top uh, which uh, you know, I'm hearing that it's like a C C triad but with a D in the bass so C over D and that leads beautifully to a D7 chord and then we're going to G7 another one of these non-diatonic chords which is really interesting so G7 this is the, the four chord in the key usually that would be uh, a major chord or a major seventh chord here we're making it a dominant seventh chord but it sounds cool so just play around with the melody on top and then we've got this little descending thing so a C chord and then just dropping the bass down so a classic kind of Beatlesy kind of moment then at the end of this section it's just so we're going from a7 to that e minor 7 shape that we had earlier Then we've got the guitar solo which is played over the chords of the main section of the tune i think there's another bridge section another main section so it's basically the same stuff just repeated there is a little outro section which is quite interesting it's kind of a, a mixture of the two parts that we've already just had so it starts off on d and then B minor so that's the first two chords of the the B section but then it goes then it goes into the chords from the A section so E minor 7 and this kind of G with the major 7 on top A7 so that's the outro chords Let's take a look at the solo then and as I think I just said the solo is played over the main chords, the A section, the, the chorus, whatever you want to call it and I'm thinking about this as being notes from the D major scale or the D major pentatonic scale. It works really nicely in this zone of the neck so the seventh position, in the seventh position you've got your D major chord in the G form if you want to think in caged terms and then around that chord shape you've got, got your D major pentatonic scale the opening lick of the solo 
that's how I'm playing it, so we're bending at the ninth fret on the G. And then I'm playing a little bend at the ninth fret on the D before jumping up to this high A note. Yeah, it's possible that it's you know, a little slide on the fourth string so that works as well. And then we've got So we're onto the B string now, we've got some more bends, so the 10th fret. Coming down to the 7th fret, then a bend at the 12th fret. And you can add some vibrato to that bend if you want to. Then the next little phrase. So into this little pentatonic box up here, 12th fret on the top string. Bending that three times, and then back to 12 on the B. Then we're into the second half of the solo with this phrase. Similar bending ideas to the ones that we've just had, and then this. A nice descending phrase, so I'm starting at 10 on the high E. And then kind of rolling over to 10 on the B. And then we're over onto the third string, kind of descending the D major scale. And over onto the fourth string. And then the last little lick of the solo. So that's how I'm hearing it. It's a bit buried under the other guitar parts and layers, but this is what I'm doing. So fairly straightforward pentatonic idea that one. So not a particularly difficult solo to play, but it's a really nice memorable melodic statement. So just make sure that you're bending in tune. You might want to work on the vibrato on the bends and all of the phrases are really nice too. So listen out for the rhythm. A lot of these phrases are coming in after beat one, so on beat two, and that can be quite a, a nice device to try if you're one of these players who always starts a phrase on beat one. Just try leaving a rest on beat one and coming in on beat two, and it's quite an effective device. Let me take you through the gear that I'm using in this video. Then, no idea what Chris Bell would have used in terms of gear on this recording. I'm not sure if there's any information out there. Perhaps there is. I know I've read a few big star books. I've seen some documentaries, but uh, there's very little definite technical information about you know, what guitars and amps were used so I've just gone with what felt right to me so for the the chords the rhythm guitar stuff I'm using my Jazz Master uh, plugged into my Fender Princeton and got a couple of overdrive pedals for the rhythm guitar stuff I was using my Nobles ODR1 natural overdrive pedal and the key effect here is you can hear on the original recording some kind of modulation effect it sounds a lot to me like a univibe Kind of pedal but any kind of modulation effect will work well so vibrato uh, phaser would work too i'm actually using uh it's called the depths by earthquaker devices which is a univibe pedal it's a really cool pedal actually it's sort of nails that sound of the original univibe but it's got a couple of extra uh, features in there voice control which is kind of a, a tone thing it's got a level control as well so quite a versatile uh, univibe type pedal so that's what I'm using for the uh, for the rhythm guitar stuff let me just uh, give you some sounds here so the uh, guitar just going straight into the Princeton sounds like this add the overdrive pedal and then uh, the depth that the vibe pedal Then for the solo, I was uh, using my Les Paul, which uh, it's a 59 reissue Les Paul. And uh, I think I was using a different overdrive pedal for the solo, so the, the tone on the record, it sounded a little bit 
a little bit thicker, quite mid rangey. So I was using my uh, J Rocket Archer overdrive pedal for the solo uh, bridge pickup. I've got the gain all the way up on the Archer. It's not a very high gain pedal, but for the solo, I wanted a little bit of uh, extra overdrive. And uh, yeah, that sounds like this. So guitar straight into the Princeton. And then with the, the Archer overdrive pedal. That's it for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. Tab, of course, is going to be up on the Patreon page. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.